Welcome to the third video in the Our Faith, Our Vote issue education video series. The United Church of Christ's Our Faith, Our Vote campaign is designed to equip the faith community for nonpartisan engagement in elections through voter registration, issue education, and voter mobilization and empowerment. We hope you'll use this video to get informed about the issues at stake in the elections, issues that our faith calls us to address. In this video, we will discuss the topic of voting rights with the help of our director of the UCC Washington DC office, Sandy Sorensen, and a wonderful panel of faith leaders well informed in this issue. Uh, Sandy, will you start us off and introduce our panelists, please? Great, thank you, Jesse, um, and thank you all for watching. Um, I'm really delighted to, to host this, um, this panel on voting rights um, as part of our, our part of our issue education series. Um, it really gets to the heart of um, the elections and um, it, it really relates to all the, other, all the other issues that we'll be covering. Um, not protecting our voting rights, um, whatever we um, change we want to have happen on climate, on the climate or on economic justice or healthcare um, will be impacted. So um, it's a really important conversation. And I'm really grateful to be joined by two of my really good Washington interfaith um, colleagues. Uh, we have with us Sister Quincy Howard, who is the government relations advocate with Network, a Catholic social justice lobby. And also with us is Christian Brooks, who's the representative for domestic issues with the Presbyterian Church USA Office of Public Witness. And both of those offices, along with our UCC Washington office, are part of an interfaith coalition called Faithful Democracy. So it's great to have you both here um, with us. So to set the context a little bit for our conversation, um, voting rights is, is often said to be the heart of the democratic process. And it's the fundamental access point for individuals um, to have a voice in um, who makes our public policy decisions. And over the years, since um, the founding of the nation, we have seen uh, steady progress in trying to expand voting rights. We had the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, 26th, 24th, and 23rd. All of those amendments um, it helped to expand uh, voting rights and eliminate discrimination. So that has always been the, the arc that we have seen. But election reform is made challenging by the fact that election law is regulated by the states. And so we have a patchwork of, of um, state and local laws, some of which require a state ID, for example, some of which do not, some of which permit mail-in ballots. Um, some have very restrictive mail-in ballot uh, regulations. So this makes it, election reform really challenging because it has to happen on a state-by-state -state level. And now we have the challenge posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and how that's impacting our, our plans for the uh, polls in November and how it's already impacted many of the primaries that we've seen recent weeks. Um, so we have a lot to talk about. So Christian, I'd like to start with you. Seven years ago, um, actually seven years ago this very month, uh, the Supreme Court in its Shelby County v. Holder decision gutted key provisions of the Voting Rights Act. What, what changes to voting rights and voting access have we seen in the past seven years? Yes, yeah, Sandy, thank you so much for this uh, for this question and thank you so much for having me on here. So after the 2013 Shelby v. Holder case, we saw a, um, a vast influx of um, voter suppression laws, right? So uh, just a little background about the, the case for uh, people who don't know much about it. So there is the, the pre-clearance section of the Voting Rights Act. And what the pre-clearance section is, there is a, um, there's a formula where the states that have a history of, of voter suppression are um, kind of, in some ways figured out by this formula. And then those states are uh, required to submit any voting laws that they are going to put forth to the Department of Justice for approval. Now, the formula 
is what was casted down. The formula was said that the formula was out of date and therefore unconstitutional. And uh, because of that, instead of changing the formula, it was casted down. So now that there is no formula, there's no list of states that have a history of voter suppression, right? So uh, because of this, there were a host of voter suppression laws that were passed with um, in 2013 and beyond. Different tactics such as extremely restrictive ID laws, um, voter purges, closing of polling locations, and things of that sort. And these um, these issues were, or these things were really put in place to suppress the vote of people of color and people with low income. Um, I uh, can remember myself, I used to live in Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania has some um, moderate bordering on severe voter ID laws. And the polling place that I usually vote at, so the way that the, um, the law works is if you vote at that place one time and you show your ID, as long as you don't move and keep voting at that location, you don't have to continue to show your ID. However, people don't know that, poll workers aren't trained to know that. So there were a couple times where I would be asked for my ID. However, that was my regular polling location. And because I voted there once, I don't have to show that again. So that I, I ran into some issues a couple times and thankfully in my case, they were figured out and I was able to move forward and vote. But what about someone who one, did not know that that was the law and two, and if, if they did know that was the law and they tried to explain that to the poll worker, what if the poll worker didn't believe them, the poll worker didn't care, things of that sort. So we have seen such an influx in voter suppression going on after the 2013 uh, Supreme Court ruling and suppressed um, is a great film to, to see the variety of voter suppression tactics is about the um, 2018 gubernatorial race in in Georgia and you can see um, on there there are people who go to vote and they're asked for birth certificates there are students who are going to vote who have been poll who have been purged from the voter rolls polling locations have been closed um, in uh, predominantly communities of color um, and low-income areas so there's just a, a host of issues that have been um, going on recently I think the state of Kansas um, a, a judge recently ruled one of their um, ID laws as unconstitutional in 2013 right after the um, Shelby B. Holder um, decision they came out with a law that said you had to show your either birth certificate or your um, passport some form of citizenship when you're voting. And that is automatically going to uh, be unfavorable for people with low income because there are certain documents, like people with low income move around a lot. So you lose important documents like birth certificates, social security cards, things of that sort. And then when we think of a passport, a passport costs upwards of $100. So, you know, who who doesn't have like $50 to buy it, get an ID or $20 to get an ID has $100 to buy a passport. So that's automatically trying to keep people, um, keep people away from the polls. And we can see how, you know, voter suppression has kind of like morphed with the times, just like technology, voter suppression morphs and changes and keeps up with the system and keeps up with the times. So I think that the casting down the, the preclearance formula for the Voting Rights Act was a, a one of the worst things that could have happened. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, it, it's so true, and, and I think if I, I remember correctly, um, it was literally within hours after the Shelby decision that the state of North Carolina Institute restrictive voter ID law. So um, the forces of um, the forces wanting to restrict voting rights were ready to go. Um, and took advantage of that opportunity. And you're so right about the morphing of um, voter suppression. Years and years ago, we would have poll taxes or um, you had to pass an exam to an answer a certain amount of questions. Um, and now we have electronic purging and we have the shutting down of polling places. And, and so it, it is so important um, that we continue this work. Quincy, um, 
In that vein, the, in the last several years, there have been a number of attempts to restore voting rights and expand access to voting. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of these efforts, like the HR 1 uh, for the People Act, the Voting Rights uh, Restoration Act, and the most currently the provisions in the HEROES COVID funding package, uh, relief package, um, that would address particularly the challenges that we're facing to hold safe and fair elections in a time of COVID-19. Yeah, sure. Thank you, first of all, for, for inviting me to speak. Um, this is always a great forum and always good to be with, uh, with this panel. Um, I, I just wanted to mention one thing that always sticks in my mind about the Shelby case was uh, the quote by Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she said that getting rid of the pre-clearance formula in the Voting Rights Act would be like telling somebody to throw away their umbrella when it's raining because they're not wet. So um, I would say that using that metaphor, we are, we are drenched at this point, um, really, and one of the things about COVID-19 is that I think it has served, like so many of our other systems, our healthcare system, our labor system, um, it's served to expose the systemic racism that are already in these systems. And the pandemic has really just laid them bare for everyone to see. And in the case of our election systems, that is uh, essentially a lack of voting rights protections. And um, it, it is so apparent to people at this point that there is that lack because going, casting your ballot could potentially be putting your life at risk. So all of a sudden the stakes seem very high and the shortcomings seem very apparent, which is, could be a good thing if we are able to use that new awareness in, in, um, in how we reform our systems moving forward. I, I think the immediate task at hand at this point is really getting Congress to fund, fund the reforms that are needed to have a meaningful election in 2020. That is um, the sort of all hands on deck at this point. That is uh, protecting voting rights. That is not something I should mention though that is going to address the underlying systemic issues of voter suppression that has been experienced for decades and centuries. So I, I think I'd first like to talk about how the, uh, the HEROES Act, which is the most recent one you mentioned, Sandy, uh, tries to get at this issue in light of the fact that we are having a potentially deadly pandemic and need to have the most pivotal election in arguably our nation's history. Um, so the HEROES Act really does what I consider, it's almost like a band-aid for voting rights, right? Um, it's the, the bare minimum that is needed at this time to be able to ensure a safe and meaningful election in the context of a pandemic. It, it doesn't fix the underlying issues with historical suppression. However, it, um, it does provide, it would, if it is passed, um, it would provide meaningful options for voters around the country to be able to cast their ballot, hopefully without exposing themselves to a potentially deadly virus. So um, the HEROES Act is looking for $3.6 billion in emergency aid that would be targeted at states. And the idea is that it would allow them to prepare and be ready for the November election. It has, uh, the HEROES Act specifically has requirements attached to this funding use, which would include early voting. So that would um, lessen the number of people, ideally, that would need to be congregated in a polling station at any given time. If you have two weeks in advance that you can go in and vote, the idea is that less people need to be crowded there on election day. Um, same day registration would be part of that so that uh, people don't need to expose themselves unnecessarily to go to the DMV or some public place in order to register. Uh, online registration would also be part of that for the same reasons. Um, vote by mail availability is uh, a key part of one of the options that's going to be needed in a pandemic, partic particularly people that are at high risk are not going to want to have to go to the poll if there is another option um, to vote from their homes. But so important also is to have polling places that are secure, that are safe, that have the equipment they need to protect the poll workers and the voters, and that have trained poll workers. 
Um, and another key piece for that funding would be voter outreach and education because it is a very confusing, um, discombobulating atmosphere and people are dealing with a lot and will continue to do so through November. So they need to have some clear resources at hand to know what the process is. I would like to talk about the Voting Rights Advancement Act, which has um, all, all three of the bills that I'm going to talk about. I, I would be remiss not to say they have already passed the House and are sitting in Mitch McConnell's graveyard. So that is the current status of these bills. Um, the Voting Rights Advancement Act passed last fall, and this is such a key key bill to get at all of the issues that Christian was talking about. Um, it is essentially a bill that would restore the protections from the known tactics of suppression that we have seen historically. It would, um, it would replace that formula that Christian was talking about and provide stronger pre-clearance measures that would allow the federal government to essentially enforce the protections, the voting protections that are already on the books and that are included and continue to be included in the Voting Rights Act. The problem is that we have not been able to enforce them since the Shelby ruling. So um, the, I, I would say that Christian has spoken to most of sort of how the bill would, would go about doing that by replacing this formula. And technically it would restore the formula and effectively, it would allow federal oversight and enforcement and protection from all of those suppressive tactics, especially in those geographic areas of known offenders, we'll call them, um, that, have, that have records of um, very clear tendencies to try to tamp down voters, communities of color and poor communities from voting. Um, this, this particular piece of legislation is really so important for security and assurance in communities of color because not only was the Voting Rights Act of 1965 one of the most effective um, civil rights laws on the books in the history of our country, but it is also um, one of the most symbolic and important ones and was so hard fought by, uh, by the Black community in particular that it has very tangible and very symbolic significance and, um, and needs to be passed. And the fact that it has taken now seven years is unconscionable. I will brush on also HR1, the For the People Act. Um, this, this bill would, would get at voter suppression tactics. Um, I would say that it, it does not have, while it has a provision that supports the, um, the, restoration of the Voting Rights Act. It does, it does not have the same targeted approach that the VRAA would. HR1 is really a systemic look at how our elections and our um, voting systems work. HR1 includes very robust sections and provisions that are targeted at expanding access to voting and making our elections easier to use and more effective. So, um, Many of these reforms also are reflected in the HEROES Act, even though this passed pre-COVID, because the idea here is to, to give more options to people to vote, to, um, to break down barriers that prevent people from voting, and to make the ballot more accessible to people in general. So you can see how that is very much in line what it, we need to see to accommodate a pandemic environment. So things like same day registration, that makes sense in a pandemic, that makes sense in regular times. Things like uh, vote by mail, having no excuse absentee ballots, that makes sense all the time, but it's especially crucial during a pandemic. So a lot of the reforms that are included in HR1, um, we also see them popping up in the HEROES Act because they make particular and resounding sense when people's lives might be at risk, depending on how they vote. A couple of other things that HR1 includes related to voting and representation that I just wanna brush on that sort of go beyond the things we've talked about, but also are very related to them are things like representation when it comes to redistricting. 
and how much your vote counts in the grand scheme of things. So HR1 would do things like adding uh, redistricting commissions that are not partisan. And HR1 also supports DC statehood, which is also a voting rights issue and also has very real racial justice implications worked into why DC residents have not been able to vote for the history of the district. Um, and then related to elections also in HR1 are um, looking at election systems, the infrastructure, making sure that they're secure and having standards around voting equipment and certification for providers that sell that voting equipment. So it's, it's very, very reasonable reforms um, that would make sense in a pandemic as well as for the future of our country. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to both of you. And, and one thing that I've noticed over the years is, and, that, and it's part of the reason I'm so grateful um, to have Christian and Quincy here with us to show the power of our, our interfaith efforts to work on election reform and voting rights expansion. Um, a, a pattern I notice, and, and perhaps you both have noticed this as well, is that during a key election year, usually a presidential election year, we start to have more and more talk about our electoral system, what needs to be fixed, what reforms would expand access to voting, and then the election comes and goes, and we're um, we're back to doing the work, you know, quietly off the radar screen, and no one's really thinking about it till the next election. And so it really does take like a lot of hard, faithful work, day in, day out, every year, not just in pivotal election years, to really um, get to some of the reforms that you both were lifting up. Um, and so I want to I want to ask uh, each of you. If we, looking beyond the 2020 elections, we know that, um, as you as you both have have said, um, COVID-19 has laid bare the inequalities in our healthcare system, and in a similar way, has laid bare the inequalities in our voting rights and our voting in our electoral process and our voting rights. And so uh, we need to respond immediately to that. We only have a very few months um, coming up to the November 2020 elections. So measures that you mentioned, Sister Quincy and the HEROES Act are, are an immediate need. But, but looking beyond the 2020 elections, what, what changes do you think um, would be important to implement to, to strengthen our democracy and make sure that everyone has a voice and a vote in the electoral process? If you were to, if you were to dream big and, and look at the systems of, of some other countries, what are some of the key things that you would um, each identify as further ways, maybe long-term um, efforts on our part to, to really strengthen our democracy and expand the right to vote and our, expand the right for each person to have a voice and a vote. And Christian, I'll start with you and then we'll pass it over to Quincy. Yes, Angie, that's a really good question. Um, and thank you for that question. So um, I would say that we have got to work towards dismantling systemic racism and white supremacy and making sure that all of our um all of our laws across the board especially our election laws and our voting laws are implemented in a racially equitable way because the way that our system is currently set up it is designed to hold people of color back and if we are implementing laws without keeping that in mind and without intentionally making efforts to combat the structures that are in place to holding people of color back, then even the most earnest things that we are doing are either one, not going to be helpful, two, they're not going to be as helpful as they would to communities that don't have those structures holding them back, or three, there will be unintentional harm done to communities of color. So um, whatever it is that we we implement moving forward for uh, fair elections to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. We absolutely have to have a racially equitable lens and making sure that we are 
keeping that in mind when we are um, implementing these laws and looking at the historical way that policy has been written and has been implemented to keep people of color back. Because again, if we don't do that, then any efforts that we make moving forward are not gonna be as helpful to people of color as they are to white communities or they are going to be more harmful to people of color. Um, I was speaking with Quincy yesterday and we were talking about mail-in voting. And you know, mail-in voting is great and mail-in voting does get a, a, a lot of people. Um, it helps a lot of people who are either unable to, to get to the polls or whatever, vote. However, there are neighborhoods where the, where the mail person does not come every day. I um, remember when I was growing up, we had a couple issues with our mail person not coming every day. So in neighborhoods where the mail person does not come regularly, the mail person doesn't come every day, only comes three times a week or whatever, mail-in voting is probably not going to be the most reliable thing for people living in that neighborhood. And these are typically neighborhoods that are in rural areas, low-income neighborhoods, uh, and neighborhoods of color. And those are things that we, we have to keep in mind. We have to stop implementing our laws in a way that are universal, so to speak, and thinking that they're going to help everybody because we're not all starting out at, at the same level. There are those of us who are, um, who's, who are starting out at a different level because historically our communities have been kept down. So if we're really trying to make sure that everyone has equal access and everyone has a voice, we have to keep that in mind when we're implementing our laws. Thank you so much, Christian. That, that is so true. Um, and I think we're sort of seeing a wake-up call in the country. I, I pray that it will be more than a wake-up call and that will, it will have some uh, it will sustain itself and really get us to look at the ways in which white supremacy and systemic racism have impacted all of the things that we're talking about, all of the issues that we care about in the elections. And you're so right that that, that larger work of dismantling white supremacy and racism needs to happen uh, in conjunction with all the other measures that we take. Um, so thank you. Christian for raising that. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has, um, has really raised it in a way that perhaps um, many people were not aware of before. Sister Quincy, what would you, what would you if you were to um, think beyond the 2020 elections and, and think of things that we could do that would really strengthen it, um, our democracy, make for a vibrant marketplace of ideas, things that we're just not even thinking about right now, but um, could dream about, what would you identify? Well, I, I would just say a lot of them um, have not only been dreamt about, but they have been passed through the house in HR1. So there's my pitch on HR1. Um, I, I would also, as Christian was talking, I was thinking about, um, I, I'm getting a lot better at being able to conceptualize like, uh, what does that mean to have a reform that has a racial justice lens? And it's helpful in this arena, I think, for people that have questions like that to look at the Voting Rights Act, because that is a, a wonderful model from back in 1965, right? We're 50 years later and we're still trying to figure out how to do this. Um, that is a question to be pondered. But the Voting Rights Act was just that type of legislation that specifically looked at what is happening and what are the barriers and how do we address them in a tangible way? And that's why it's been so effective for 50 years. Um, but I, I think some of the other things that are coming to mind um, would, would be ways to incentivize civic engagement, things like um, making uh, election day a holiday, right? Uh, or having automatic registration when you get your driver's license. Um, things that are just like one, finding ways to break down barriers that maybe people don't even recognize are barriers, but are very real and add up and um, uh, overall create a disincentive uh, or a lack of interest in engaging. Um, so I, another thing I wanted to lift up was, um, and, and it sounds initially like it's counter to what Christian was saying as far as like there are different needs and different com communities that need to be recognized and accommodated with intentionality. Um, what, what the way I would pose that is that 
there needs to be federal oversight. And I'm not talking about a one size fits all. I'm talking about federal oversight in, uh, to create a baseline of requirements above which states can accommodate, um, but that are, do create a baseline. At this point, the states are essentially, there are some states that are dragging down what that baseline is, and that is creating monumental disparities within states and between states. What we need is for the federal government, as HR1 proposes in many cases, to really play a role there uh, because we know that the federal government does have a role to play when it comes to protecting voting rights. So they need to actively engage in that role and they need to um, set some standards for what states need to live up to that they know should be baseline. And we already know what those standards are. Um, and then two other sort of high line reforms that I think would really make a huge difference in the way that our democracy is functioning and that are also included in HR1. I alluded to earlier with gerrymandering, the, it can't be um, over, overemphasized how much impact that has on political debate and on the partisan dualism that we are seeing in our country right now. When you have elected officials that essentially get to choose who is going to be electing them and ensuring that they will get reelected, that means that they aren't accountable to, to the constituents in their area, right? They are accountable to a very narrow group of people with um, specific ideologies. Uh, and gerrymandering was originated around communities of color and low-income communities and has sort of morphed as it's become perfected with big data and all of these other tools that are at our disposal now has really become um, more of a partisan focus, which also tends to unfold in sort of racial and income lines as well. Um, so I think having independent redistricting committees in states, and some states have already made those reforms, but making that a baseline requirement nationally would, would have a huge impact on our dialogue, our civic dialogue. And the final one that I think is so pivotal and is, is just so deeply embedded in all of the things we're talking about is campaign finance reform. Um, the way that big money and special interests are able to manipulate our systems today is obscene and is completely distorting any semblance of um, voice that the people would like to be able to have in our election process. So um, HR1 in, includes really what I think is just a, a, it has a poetic beauty to it. This campaign finance reform would essentially be small donor matching funds. So that would essentially amplify the voice of somebody with $50 sixfold. So that can have a very big cumulative impact. And the beauty of that matching fund, it's not taxpayer funded. It would actually be funded by corporate malfeasance and tax dodgers and adding a fee to what, when they get caught at doing whatever it is they do that we hear about every day and they pay fees on, adding a, a percentage to that that would go to then amplifying the voices of the common people. So it's almost like a redistributing financially of how the campaign finance system is currently working, which is totally lopsided towards the same parties that are um, bad actors in the first place. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Quincy. And it, it occurs to me that as much as we celebrate our um, democratic process in, in the United States, are we're playing catch up in terms of the actual processes we have in place to make that a reality. Um, we have a really long ways to go and as much as we try to be or position ourselves to be um, a leader in, in free and democratic elections, when we look at, at the processes that other countries are using, um, some countries that um, allow for a whole week to vote or have a, a voting uh, election day as a national holiday. It's really um, quite humbling in, in some ways that there are many ways in which we could expand our access to the polls, expand 
the conversation or in the public square so that we can really uh, tackle um, the huge challenges in front of us is going to take every voice and every vote and every idea to be represented. And yet here we are going backwards and at a particularly alarming time. So my last question to both of you would just be, what's the most, um, what's a key takeaway that you would, would, you would want to leave, a, sort of a one or two sentence takeaway that you would um, want to end with as we wrap up our, our session on voting rights? Christian? Thanks, Sandy. Ah, this is on the spot. Um, I think that the one of the key takeaways that I would want for um, for people to to leave with af as they are watching this is one: voting is extremely important. It is the people who we are electing into office. They are the people who are writing the laws. They are the people who are, in some ways, controlling the system. So voting is extremely extremely important but two we have to look we have to look at the issues of voting democracy reform election integrity we have to look deeper at these issues and not just look at what's on the surface because there are some deeply um deep rooted insidious things that are going on within these systems and that are baked into these systems that were put into the very foundation of these systems when they were created and we have to think about those things we have to look at those things and we have to make an, an effort to intentionally combat and dismantle that if we are going to move forward and have uh, fair elections, make sure that everyone has uh, a voice in uh, not only in voting, but also representation in who's running and who is able to run. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Spot on, Christian. Quincy? I'm so glad that Christian has had to go first every time. I'm like, oh, that's good. I'll build off of that. Um, I, I think the takeaway that is coming to me is, is twofold. The first one is this is a wake up moment for us and it is make it or break a time. Like this coming election can't be, um, cannot be stressed enough the importance of it. Uh, and I would add that it's very, very likely and possible that we will get through it and we will have, I'll just call it a successful outcome um, and after that, we will have gone through a world of hurt um, and potentially still be in not a good place as a nation, but we will also be well placed to rebuild. And one of the, uh, one of the things that really gives me inspiration is a report that was released a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, which is as old as the nation is. I think it was like Andrew Jackson that founded the institution itself, right? So it goes way back. And they just released a report called Our Common Purpose, Reinventing Our Democracy in the 21st Century, or something along those lines. And, um, and this report is really so inspiring. It's values-based. It's talking about the principles behind our founding documents that have never never been realized, right? I mean, we talk the talk, but it's, it's never been true to what was written, as we all know. And um, this report is really about how do we finish, how do we finish that project that they started? And, um, and, and the other thing that I find inspiring about this report is that um, over the next five years, six years through 2026 is gonna be the 250 year anniversary of the nation. And so this report, they're really framing it from the lens of, of like, how, how can we rebuild and reinvent our nation over the next six years, according to this blueprint or, or other reforms that get to the principles underlying it, um, to find ourselves in a new place at 250 years. Thank you both so much. Uh... Christian and, and Quincy, um, that was a great wrap up and I did put you on the spot, I must say, um, and, you, and you responded beautifully. <laughs>
I, and I think you, what you raised is that there's, there's really kind of two levels to this work and they have to happen together and they have to happen every year, not just in an election year. These are, these are uh, changes and um, transformations that we need to make that will take day-to-day -day work um, long after November 3rd, 2020. And so I really appreciate how you both lifted up that deep, deep work on the systemic inequalities upon which um, these structures were built. So if we don't address those inequalities, uh, we'll simply be adding to them, um, as well as the work that we need to do now in the next several months to the best of our ability um, to make this a free and fair election for all. And so I, I'm grateful to you both for lifting up those, those kind of two levels of the work and leading us towards um, really got our, our marching orders for now is to, is, to, is to do this work that we need to do for up until November 3rd uh, and then keep at it and keep at it and look at that, um, that reinvention and that revisioning Sister Quincy that you were mentioning, summoning up um, the courage and the energy to really reach um, our ideals and reach the visions that we say we believe in. So thank you so much, Christian and Quincy. You are wonderful colleagues and highly valued collaborative partners in this work. I'm so grateful to both of you and thank you for taking the time to be here and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Jesse. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you to the three of you for taking the time to have this important conversation. And thank you to those watching this video in the Our Faith, Our Vote issue education video series. I hope that you'll use this information to inform your participation in the election season and that you'll share what you have learned with those in your congregation and in your community. You can find this video and other resources at our website at ourfaithourvote.org.